Um, this is a bit like speed dating, so um, let's go. <laughs> um, I'm going to start with red flags for non-accidental injury. These are out of your Auckland Regional Health Pathways, uh, so you can see them there. I'm just going to quickly go through them. So any injury to a young or non-ambulatory child, um, any injury without an adequate explanation or an identified event, um, or if there is a delay in them presenting, or if it's inconsistent with child's developmental capacity, and we'll uh, speak about that a little bit later. This is a really important one, as Sheila said, about 30% of uh, babies with a head injury are missed on their first presentation to healthcare. It's more likely to be white, middle class and intact families. That's what the studies tell us. So if you have a child with this, head injury has to be part of your differential diagnosis. Um, oronasal bleeding in a young infant um, is almost always related to something in the mouth and asphyxia. So it's a pretty rare presentation in a very young baby, so think of that as well. And then injuries which appear to be inflicted, that's kind of the big bag load of everything else. Um, and I'll show you some examples of that as we go through. If you see any of these red flags, and this should lead to you seeking some advice from the paediatrician on call, and that will depend where you are in the country or in the region, um, you can always give our team a call and we can give you some advice. Okay. Um, this looks like a really busy table. Um, you'll be pleased that I'm not actually going to go through all this. But this table was um, produced as a part of a uh, literature review looking at population prevalence of bruising by age. And what we know is those babies who don't cruise really bruise. And the paper that's the, probably the most useful out of this um, table is the paper by Sugar, which was from 1999, but still relevant. They looked at 973 children up to three years of age where they came for a well child check. So these are children that rocked up for their well child check and they looked for bruises. And what they found was that bruising was extremely rare in, in infants younger than six months. And in fact, only about half a percent had bruises. And it was pretty uncommon in, in children who were preambulatory before nine months of age at about 1.7%. And so about 2.2% of babies who were pre-cruisers had bruises, compared to almost 18% of cruisers, and about 52% of children who are walking defined by taking two independent steps or more. So if your baby is not moving, they shouldn't have any bruises at all. So just remember that when you are reviewing children. Hopefully that's not my phone. Um, <laughs> This kind of leads me to this bruising clinical decision rule, and I'm going to go through this. This is a uh, decision rule that was developed out of some of that previous research looking at uh, prevalence of bruising, but also where we see bruising and what things can help us when we're looking at bruising. We know that bruising is the most common child physical abuse injury. It's also the most common thing that is overlooked or misdiagnosed prior to a fatality or near fatality from child abuse. So we need to do this properly. So this clinical decision rule, um, the most recent version of it, and the validation for this tool, was published this year in 2021 by Mary Clyde Pierce. Um, I've put the reference at the back if you wanted to read it. Um, so it's hot off the press, 2021. I'm going to give this to you. There's three parts to it. So the 10 faces, you're like, what does it mean? So bruising to any of these areas. So the torso the ear and the neck, that's your 10, and faces as frenulum, angle of the jaw, cheek, meaning the fleshy part of the cheek, the eyelids, or the subconjunctivae. The four has two parts to it. So if a child is less than four years of age with 10 faces bruising, that's concerning. Or any bruising anywhere on an infant aged 4.99 months or less. These are Americans, right? Um, sorry if these are <laughs> um, There is some controversy around that um, for, I think it was partly to make it an easier thing to remember. So there is some controversy about whether it should be older, up to sort of six months or so. But essentially think of any child who's not moving in that category. So if you're seeing a bruise anywhere on a child that's not moving, you need to be thinking about it. And the, third, the, the little P there is for patterned bruising. Um, so loops, um, linear marks, anything that looks clearly patterned. When they validated the study and looked at how it worked, they found it 96% sensitive and 87% specific. 
at distinguishing between accidental and abusive bruising. So we think it's a useful tool. It's certainly what we've anecdotally been doing for a while, is saying these are concerning places uh, for bruises in children. So I'm going to just show you what that looks like visually. So in accidental injuries, we typically see them on the front of the body. They're usually small and mainly over the bony prominences. And in children, that's often the forehead because their heads are relatively bigger and they knock them on things. So T-zone of the head and bony prominences in general. In the non-accidental injuries, they could be anywhere. Um, but look at the 10 faces kind of areas. So just some examples. Sorry, I'm going to show some images. So let's go. If we're looking at these, both of these photos, they show eye bruising, but they also have subconjunctival hemorrhage. So both of those things are concerning on the 10 faces. You'll also notice on that one on the right, on that photo on the right, there's clustering of bruising on the side of the face as well. And clustering is one of those things that we look at in patterning. So this would be concerning to us. Hopefully it would be concerning for you guys as well. Um, ears are often overlooked when young people are being examined because they kind of hide away a bit, but they're really important. We very rarely see bruises in the ear from anything else. You don't tend to fall on your ear and cause damage to your ear, unless you're a rugby player or something like that. So ears are important. Look behind the ears and also in the same region, look behind in the scalp as well at the same time and, and check for any bruising. This is a little cluster of bruises on the torso. Again, that's concerning. Although this is on the leg, uh, it is a linear bruise and we shouldn't see linear bruises in children or anyone for that matter and a little cluster of bruises in the torso. Uh, in the mouth, look everywhere in the mouth, so you're also looking at the teeth and gums, but the frenulum, although it can be seen in accidental injuries, and in fact both my children had frenulum injuries from falls, um, <laughs> and it's typically a face plant. Okay, so you get that face plant, you often have abrasions, other things in the way. Um, it, but for children, if you've got an absent frenulum, we think about forced, repeated force feeding, and if we, Otherwise, we're thinking of direct blows to the mouth can also cause those injuries. So this is a four-year-old child who has a bruise on the fleshy part of the cheek. He also has significant bruising over the torso. Um, we routinely would do think about skeletal surveys up to the age of two, but in this case, because of the extensive bruising, we also skeletal surveyed this child, um, which showed some fractures. Um, of both proximal, uh, both humeri. He also had a rib fracture and a toe fracture. Um, this is a little baby with a small bruise on the angle of the jaw, but also to the torso, just by that tape measure. These look like insignificant small bruises, but this is a baby that doesn't move. This child had rib fractures. This is pattern bruising, so tramline bruising. This is a good example of a looped bruise. Uh, I'm not going to go into exactly how they form, but essentially they, the blood presses around the outside of the object and can show you what that looks like and cause tram lines. This is another example of pattern bruising. Um, so this Y shape or honeycomb type pattern. Uh, this is from finger grabbing, so whole finger outlining the fingerprint marks. Another example of patterned bruising, this is from a hyperflexion or forced squeezing of the hands which causes this um, distinctive pattern of bruising over the uh, palm eminences, the palm creases and the interdigital creases. And clustering, don't forget clustering of bruises even if they're in normal places. Remember you don't need proof, um, your role is to go, this doesn't look right and I have suspicions um, and you run the risk of serious harm if you don't think about this. I've put up some contact details for Aranga Tamariki, but they are actually on your health pathways. Um, you are protected by law. Make sure you give them all the information though. There is, they would want to know who they are, who the family is, where you got your information from. Don't use medical language. Don't use abbreviations. These are social workers, not medical people. Um, and tell them what the harm is to the child. And we would routinely uh, tell the family we're making a report of concern. Um, you can get a written uh, referral form if you 
uh, ring Arang Tamariki, they will send you this. I'm going to get, try and get this put onto the health pathways for you so that you can do that. This is just an example of, some of what that looks like. It's a good aid memoir if you've never made a report of concern. Um, so hopefully that will go on. That was it, really? But that's the paper there. I'm going to hand over to Silvana to do the last bit for us.